This is Bumper to Bumper, the car show. Drive in anxious and cruise out confident with the best automotive information for your vehicle. And now your hosts, Matt Allen and Dave Riccio. Well, good morning, everybody, and thank you for joining us for another edition of Bumper to Bumper Radio. I am Matt Allen, along here with my friend Dave Riccio, and we're here to help you with your car every single Saturday morning at 11. We will be your KTAR car guys for the next hour. And, uh, hey, the other 23 hours of the rest of the day and whatever's left and all those other times, you can find us 24 hours a day, seven days a week at bumper to bumper radio.com so the purpose of this show is just to help you be in the know when it comes to automotive uh, anything automotive really whether you're buying a car selling a car fixing a car driving a car you might be doing that right now uh, any of those questions you might have we can help you with that and all you have to do to get that help is give us a call at 602-277-5827 it's 602-277-KTAR and last week, Dave, we were out at the uh, Phoenix Open. It's good to be in the studio today. A lot of distractions mm. out there. Yeah, it was. A lot, a, lot of, uh, a lot of traffic walking by, a lot of people, a lot of noise. So it's kind of cool to be in here and, and be settled down. So I even forgot what we talked about last week. Oh, with, we, uh, talked about, uh, we talked about diagnostic, a little bit about the, the seat of the pants feel and the test drive. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so, it's such a diagnostic is such an issue. You know, people, what, what's diagnostic? Don't you guys just plug into my car and tell me what's wrong with it? And uh, so, and, and you can go down to the auto parts store and they will plug into it and they'll get you a list of, of codes. Uh-huh. And uh, I would love to talk to people about what the heck those codes are. What they mean, and is that the diagnostic? Is that the diagnostic, Matt? Well, you know, di- diagnostic, if you look at the term diagnosis, a diagnosis is a the results or the culmination of a series of tests to come up with a diagnosis. So I pay, tell people we have to do testing and get information. And once we can get the information, then I can make a diagnosis. So, no, plugging in, that's easy. Hell, I can do that for you. I'll do it all day long. Line them up. I'll just tell you what the code is. Well, I think there's an and, app on your cell phone now if you want. You yeah, can... yeah, you can buy that little gadget and never spend money on auto repair again. That's the TV that, that <laughs> I see. I mean, all, never, you're done. You're done. It's, it's free. 69 bucks, and after that, it's... You know, because it's all a sham. We know that, like this diagnostic stuff. <laughs> no, so that that's the easy thing, but that is not diagnosis. That's just getting a little bit of information. That's taking one snapshot. It gets you the code. It tells you what neighborhood uh, you might be looking in. But that's, I mean, l- let's really talk about, Dave, I guess, the diagnostic process. What do we have to do and what equipment do we have to have? I mean, Well, let's start with this. Why do we get diagnostic? Usually it's because that little check engine light comes on. Right. Okay. And uh, that little check engine light comes on, and you say, oh, shoot, what do I do with the check engine light? And you go, that check engine light will come on for 200 different reasons, maybe 250. I don't really know. It comes on for a lot of different reasons. And so you don't know. It doesn't discriminate between different problems. It's just, hey, there's a problem going on. So when the light comes on. But you, more specifically, there's a problem going on related. The light really is mandated by the government. So it's more specific, not just a problem, a problem related to how this engine runs, how well it performs, and its potential to cause high tailpipe emissions. So that's why the light comes on. But, yes, it's a problem. So, yeah, it's a, it's a problem, but, like, it'll come on for transmission reasons. If a transmission's not working right, well, there's more stuff going out the tailpipe to get you to go one mile. So it can come on for a lot of reasons, even even just different than you know how the engine's running so <clears throat> there's lots of reasons why it comes on and so what happens is the computer is constantly testing the car so it's running tests it's measuring the exhaust it's measuring different solenoids it's measuring different sensors and when it sees a problem well it sets an error message in the computer we refer to it as a diagnostic trouble code and the yellow light is telling us there's a code in the computer so that's what that's what that check engine light is all about now, do you have to slam on the brakes, pull over, and get your car towed to the shop? Yeah, no, yeah, no, you don't. You. <laughs> you, no, you, you don't. And, and um, but we should be familiar with what that light means. I mean, so sometimes well, you never really need to slam on the brakes. Remember, the check engine light is an amber light. Green is good. Amber's warning. Red is stop. Red's bad, right? Red's bad. Pull over, so, get it towed. So amber. Just it's it's something you need to be you just next caution. time cautious. Mm-hmm. Yes, exactly. So we had a customer yesterday, Dave, regular, and she says calls up in a panic, check engine light is on. 
no problem is the light flashing. We'll get to why the lights flash a little bit later, but we're just talking about this light. So no problem. The light's on. It's not flashing. Any noises? If, if the light weren't coming on, would you suspect any other issues? No. That's her answer. No problem. Drive it down to the shop. It's Friday afternoon. She's concerned about her car for the weekend. So I do take my little I, – I, now I'm in AutoZone mode. I don't bring my – my I mean Acme mode. <laughs> I'm sorry. Those kids who work there are younger than you, so don't don't, don't be in their, their class. So um, – so I get my little code reader, not the you know not the real diagnostic. You know, there's a a computer. A lot of a lot of times we have to use a laptop or some other factory interface. But we also got the little ninety nine dollar parking lot jobby too. So I run, I go out and I look, and she's got a code for a catalytic converter. Well, see here I am telling you what it is. it's not a catalytic converter code. It's a catalyst efficiency. That doesn't mean the catalytic converter is bad. But my point here is she wanted to know if she was safe for the weekend. You're okay to drive that. In, in that mm -hmm. case. And what I was getting at is some people want to say, oh, just ignore the light. It doesn't mean anything. You don't need to, to test that. And I think really that is code word for I don't really know how to fix it, and I don't want to tell you that. <laughs> so just, you know what I mean? <laughs> just don't worry about it. <laughs> but the process, so we have to – so, yeah, you get the trouble code, and then the code – I've heard this described uh, a long time ago. It's like mailing a letter. You have to have a complete address. Name, address, unit number, city, state. You don't really need that, but you need a zip code. Getting the trouble code is like getting the zip code. Hmm. Mail a letter to your grandma with just the zip code. Not going to get there. Not going to get there. Don't like your grandma. <laughs> <laughs> no. So you've got – so there's just a process you have to go through, and, and that takes time. And, and I know nobody really works for free. Well, yeah. So the, the diagnostic process is a lot of times if the lights comes on, that's the, that's the first place we're going. And you even hear us ask the question when you're calling in, we say, is the check engine light on? And that means a lot to us. It tells us, yes, the car knows there's a problem, or maybe the car doesn't know there's a problem, but there still could be a problem. So the other thing that happens is no code diagnostic. So sometimes we plug into the computer, and it thinks everything is peachy fine, except for when you drive the car, you know there's a problem. So we call that a no-code diagnostic, and that's where it gets hard for some people, you know, uh, in, in this business because they don't have any, any hints as far as what the problem might be. And so it's kind of that initial hint that gets you to the answer. So that's where the, the, the uh, technicianing really comes in. Well, and that's where you have to have the ability to go back to the pre-computer mindset and build it have a feeling or understanding of what where is this symptom is this an ignition system problem is this a solenoid problem is, is this a transmission problem that's really not it's a transmission symptom but it's really got an ignition coil that's making someone think it's a transmission problem and you have to remember for a misfire for example that car might need to see you know 200 misfires on this cylinder within um, so many revolutions of the engine or so much time pass by well, we might be able to feel that at, you know, let's just say the spec is 200. We might be able to feel it at 175, but the computer doesn't care yet. Yeah. That doesn't necessarily mean it's not a problem because you might feel it actually. Well, in the in early days of OBD2, uh, those check engine lights came on way too often and uh. way too easy. So what happened, you know, when it first came around is that the parameters were really tight. As the years went on, because you're a, you're a, a, a manufacturer of a vehicle, you sell Ford trucks and... Every time the car burps or farts or does normal things, you, your little light comes on, and then you got to go in the shop. So there were annoyance checks. Is that why lights. the light is on in your forehead, Dave, all the burping and farting? <laughs> <That's just exactly. laughs> it is always illuminated. So so the manufacturers loosen the parameters up, and so a, a, a lot of times there is a problem, but it's not bad enough you know, to say, hey, we got a, we got a problem down here. So we see a lot of that stuff happen, too. Yeah, and, and the, the – um, you have to, and that's the thing that that uh, goes back to what you said. The the consumer a lot of times, and I don't. I guess this comes a little bit from that auto parts store checking, or you know, I think auto repair in general. Everybody just thinks it's easy to do. Their uncle does it, you know. So or so did it once upon a time? Yeah, or back in college or whatever. But you have to be. It's just like a doctor to somebody. You take this screen full of data. Mm -hmm. There's a couple hundred numbers on there, or PIDs they call them. The the information. There's several of those pids. You have to have the ability to look at those and without the help of the computer telling you one of them is bad and see how they correlate and, and how they make sense and, and, and whatnot. So that's the trick to the diagnosis or the testing. You know, one of the tricky things that came up, and we had a car just in the shop for this yesterday, definitely had a problem. Check engine light different comes on in a drive. We plug into it. There's nothing there. But guess what else is bad? 
the battery is bad. Okay, and that happens a lot. These computers in these vehicles have to maintain voltage in order to keep memory. And this is one of those cars where overnight the thing sits, the code goes away. Okay, because the battery's not good enough. Or when they go to start it, the starter drags yeah. the voltage down, and so you, you drop below nine, pol- nine volts, and and the computer doesn't work like it's supposed to. So keeping a good battery in your car is is a must. And this is more a problem on the modern vehicle. As as these cars get more complex, you got to have a good power source in there. So first thing we do when we check out a car is test the battery. If it doesn't have a good battery in it, we're going to call the customer and say, hey, you need an interstate battery. We keep interstate batteries on the shelf because they are covered coast to coast. they got a great warranty, two-year free replacement, so interstate batteries. But you cannot underestimate the, the importance of having a good battery in your car. So when you come back, we got wide open lines at 602-277-5827, 602-277-KTR. Whether you got a check engine light or you got a code and you want to talk about it, we can help you with any of that. You listen to Matt and Dave, your KTR Car Guys on Bumper to Bumper Radio. There's nothing more important than family. Hi, Kurt Rock for Kurt's Auto Repair. Family owned and operated and bumper to bumper radio preferred. We've been taking care of Valley families and their auto care needs with a perfect better business record for over 27 years. Come experience the difference our ASC Master Techs can make for you and your family at Kurt's Auto Repair. Just east of I-17 at 22nd Avenue and Bell Road or online at mycarhurts.com. Gas or diesel, foreign or domestic. If your car hurts, take it to Kurtz. Grand Canyon University proudly unveils its newly remodeled championship golf course right in the heart of Phoenix. Masterfully redesigned by the renowned architect John Fott, the GCU golf course is a plush oasis of fairways, beautiful greens, and mature trees. The brand new 22,000 square foot clubhouse features a restaurant and bar, fully equipped pro shop, and luxury event space. Come and experience a championship golf course with affordable rates. Visit gcugolf.com to book your tee times. I know about it. You know about that country gate? I know about it, for sure. You've been down that road? Well, welcome back to Bumper to Bumper Radio, where we're helping you with your car at 602-277-5827, 602-277-KTAR. We're talking about check engine lights and diagnostic, and what what does that mean? So if you've got a check engine light you've been ignoring and you want to know more about it, maybe we can help talk you through it. If you don't have a check engine light and you've got anything going on with your car, Let's talk about it. Give us a call, 602-277-5827. And, uh, Matt, it certainly has changed the way auto repair has happened over the years. I mean, in the old days, you could get underneath your hood, you could sit out your lawn chair and take your cooler in underneath that hood and change the spark plugs. And now you lift up the hood and where are the spark plugs? <laughs> yeah, they're hidden underneath these <laughs> these uh, covers that are designed to look like an engine. But they're you, know, you like, Dave, you get the transverse engine on the front-wheel drive car, but then they put this plastic decorative shield on that makes it look like a longitudinal v8 or something oh yeah like it's got like tubes to make it look like a intake manifold or something everything's hidden and covered and and i don't know if that's because they don't want you to see it they want to protect it they don't want you to touch it they want it to look good in the showroom when they pop the hood you walk over there and you go oh 3500 i don't know what that means but it looks good (laughs) yeah exactly right so anyway we got some phone cars starting to roll through at 602-277-5827 let's go with bob in scottsdale he's got a 2014 gmc sierra how can we help you bob you're on bumper to bumper radio morning guys i don't really have a problem but on that 5.3 v8 you know with the cylinder deactivation do you see many people where they have problems with the the lifters because you know when you're on the highway it goes down to four cylinders from eight cylinders I think they refer to that to AFM, right? Alternative Fuel Management. Uh-huh. And, uh huh. Or POS. Yeah. <laughs> 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 no, I I, 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 do believe that it can be a little bit, you know, a little bit problematic. You know, it's, it's, uh, and there's, I mean, GM's not the only one doing that. There's other companies doing that as well. You know, I know it, it changes the way that we rebuild transmissions. I remember when they started coming around 2007, 2008, they started showing up. And we changed the way we had to rebuild the transmission. Because we built it before, 
we would eliminate some of the torque converter slip because it would make the, the, the transmission more, you know, beefy. On the other end, if remember that white Tahoe we had that uh-huh. you and I couldn't figure out? Right. And we had just, the way we rebuilt the transmission, it caused it when that active fuel management was happening or coming on or shutting off, you would feel it in the vehicle. Feel hesitation on deceleration. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, but, you know, I had a 5.3 in my shop. It was a 2007 this week, and it had lifter noise, and it had a bad lifter. First, we thought, well, maybe it's the uh, oil pump O-ring, kind of overfilled it, tilted the vehicle, looked at that first, and uh, we dialed it down to, hey, we've got, a, we've got a problem with the lifter. So you can have lifter problems. Yeah, you know, what I was going to say is, is I don't think that some of those lifter problems that, the, that it seems to be, I don't want to use the broad stroke, you know, the all they all do it, all those 5.3s, but it seems to be if there's an engine failure on those, it's around the camshaft or the lifters. And, and so... I, I think what Bob was thinking, is there some correlation between the, the fuel management system and the lifter failure? And I don't think so. Yeah, we just there's a solenoid in there. We're just shutting down the flow to those four, you know, those those lifters that are on that side or the opposing side. Whatever. Yeah, and, and um, but I think it goes back to the oil. Mm. You know, and it, that's when Chevy started using that Dexos oil, and not everybody wanted to use it. So it was a special oil, and I remember people going, oh. Yeah, you know the oil for your car, the right oil is it, the oil change is sixty five dollars. Oh, I don't want that one. Just do the thirty dollar. You know, mm-hmm. so some of these problems were self inflicted by not using the right oils, or or maybe some some marketing got involved in the length of the oil change or something. Well, I think it, I think it does. I mean, the the best thing you can do on these on people, you know, because we 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 were at three thousand mile oil changes, you know, forever, and then we saw that the the recommendations backing off, and they backed off too much. Yeah. And now we're seeing, you know, the pendulum is swinging. And so, you know, be good on your oil changes. It's going to it's gonna save you money down the road with, you know, stupid, stupid well, things. Well, some of these GM cars several years ago, they had problems with timing chains. Mm. There was not really a timing chain problem. It's like you said, that the, the parameter was widened too much. So the recall or the technical service bolt and to correct this timing chain failure problem was a computer reprogram to tell the – the counter to make the oil change light come on sooner. Hmm. That's the fix. Well, I think the best way Bob can k- take care of that truck is just to continue to live right. You know, open doors for little old ladies, and you will never have lifter problems. So, anyway, thanks for the call, Bob. 602-277-5827. Let's go with uh, Andrew in Phoenix. He's got a 2004 Chevy Impala. How can we help you, Andrew? You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Hi, thank you. Yeah, I just wanted to say about the um Codes, you know, I had a a knock sensor code, and then I cleaned all the battery terminals, and then it finally threw another code for camshaft position sensor, and basically the wires were just bare, and I just had to restart the wires together and put them back together, and everything cleared up. So starting out with... The wires for the cam sensor or for the uh, knock sensor? The cam sensor. Okay. Interesting. Mm-hmm. So, so got, it was throwing the knock sensor code. Well, yeah. After I, oops. No, no, I say go ahead. So it was throwing the knock sensor code, but you really found the problem was more related to the camshaft sensors. Per, yes, exactly. See, now, have you driven the car a couple trips since you've made the repair? Yeah, it runs great. That's yeah, aw- that's perfect. awesome, and that's that's a perfect example, Dave, of the code. Because if you would have gone and maybe got a code read somewhere, you know, you would have... Uh, they would have sold you a cam sensor. No, they would have sold oh, you a knock sensor. sensor. Sure. They would have sold you a knock sensor. Yeah, the... Uh, <clears throat> The uh, I had I had a vehicle in my shop. It was a Jeep Grand Cherokee, and uh, it had all these codes for the transmission. Mm-hmm. And what it ended up being was the O2 sensor was was bad because the water pump was leaking on the O2 sensor, which was back feeding some voltage and causing it to have transmission codes. Okay, <laughs> you would have never fixed your transmission unless you fixed the water pump. And I know that sounds weird, but that is exactly what happened. Yeah, that car so, would have got like three. That thing would have been in and out four. Why is this problem and, happening? And this is one thing I was I was asking Matt before the show. I said that the newer the car, in, in other words, in the life cycle of the car, when a car's got fifty thousand miles on it and it throws a code, as people say, code throws well. Chances are it's it's re- going to be relatively close to accurate. Now, when you start to get cars where wires are chafing, and now it's got 150,000 miles on it, and there's been 27 different mechanics work on the car, now now that becomes a lot less accurate. It's still a piece of information, but 
in his case, it was the possibilities of it starting to get fray off and get down the side road, so to speak. Yeah. Because and that, and I might just speculate what happened on his car if he had a a cam sensor or a crank sensor that wasn't quite working right. It may not be out of spec to cause a cam sensor code or anything like that to come on, but it could cause the engine to misfire a little bit or not. Not necessarily misfire, but fire on time, creating the knock. So the knock sensor picked up the noise or the knock in the engine caused by the cam sensor or crank sensor not working right. So I think the key here is that there has been a over, and I would say it's marketing driven, but there's been an oversimplification of we're going to plug into your car, it's going to tell us what's wrong, and then your car is going to be fixed. And so sometimes we have to continually re-educate it at our, at, our, at our service counter, and we want you to feel comfortable when you go into auto shops. That's what we're here for, is to help you feel comfortable when they say, oh, we gotta, we're going to want to diagnose that. That sounds like something we need to, need to diagnose. And what does that mean You know exactly? And, oh, they're just going to plug into it and it's going to give them the answer, and I'm going to pay 100 bucks for that. It's not true, you know, so there's there's more to it. So we want to get rid of that, some of that oversimplification. And sometimes it is just that simple, but that's not usually the case. Now, Dave, sometimes, you know, um, you, know you charge like a $78 transmission diagnosis, for example. But then we have to, you know, at my shop, we, we're similar. We, we have a range sometimes. And people will say, well, that's a big range. But we need to, we kind of got to have some room to wiggle in, so to speak. So I don't want to quote you. I might quote, depending on the complexity of the problem, after we've after we've interrogated you and you've had the spotlight on you and we've asked you all these questions, when the car does it, when it doesn't, and what's this, and does it make a noise, or any of those things, after we've gathered all that information, then we have to kind of know what we think it's going to take. So we're going to give a window. You might tell someone it's a 100 to $300 to diagnose the car. Well, why on earth would it be $300? Well, not very often do we have to take that far to get into it to uh, to get to the answer, but we also need a little bit of wiggle room. I tell like I tell my customers, if I get in there and I find this one little, I find a vacuum leak and I need a twenty five or even a fifty dollar part, I don't want to have to stop my process, call you, then you have to call me back or have to talk to a spouse or friend or somebody, and, and then restart the process. So that gives us a window to work in, and we can. We can get into that a, a little bit more and explain that that process too when we come back. So when we come back, we've got Larry, Kenny, and Anthony, and more open lines at 602-277-5827. You're listening to Matt and Dave, your KTR Car Guys on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Having an accident is stressful. Dealing with the repair process shouldn't be. Hi, Leo Petrozella for Campus Body Salon. The right to choose a repair facility is yours, not the insurance companies. We work with all insurance companies, but we work for you. Campus Body Salon, bumper-to-bumper radio approved and independently family-owned and operated since 1973. Check out our Cash for Your Crash program where we pay you 10% off of your repair up to $1,000. Campus Body Salon, the best care in collision repair. Hi, I'm Dave Riccio, owner of Tri-City Transmission. Well, you may have come to know us for being a transmission expert, What you may not know is that our customers regularly ask us why we don't perform repairs to the rest of the vehicle. You guys are so great. Why work on just the transmission? Well, the request became hard to ignore, and three years ago, we began to build an infrastructure to perform general automotive repair. We weren't going to do general repair if we couldn't be great at it. So in 2013, we began the soft opening of Tri-City Auto Repair on Smith Road. We brought on ASC Master Technicians to work side-by-side with our Master Transmission Technicians. The combination of the best in both of these trades has created a synergy that allows us not only to fix your transmission, but to service and repair your whole car and to do it well. Let's face it, the modern car has become so integrated. We believe all of our expert knowledge puts us ahead of the curve. Find us at tricitytransmission.com or tempeautorepairshop.com. That's (laughs) tempeautorepairshop.com. It sounds like they've just had the accurate automotive experience. We're family owned and operated and have served the Mesa, Tempe, Gilbert communities for over 22 years. We focus on building long lasting relationships and oh yeah, listening to you so that we can understand, meet and exceed your expectations. One location, 14 bays, 88 years of automotive expertise and a passionate commitment to customer service and excellence. My name is Lee Weatherby and I approve this message because it's true. We love what we do and we want to do it for you. Accurate Automotive, the home of friends serving friends. KTAR FM, Glendale, Phoenix. 
Phoenix. KTAR News on 92.3 FM. Arizona's news station. News station. KTAR. On air. 92.3 FM. Online at KTAR.com. And streaming live on the KTAR News app. Your breaking news and traffic. Now. It's 11.30. I'm Griselda Satino. Here's our top story. Team USA has some catching up to do at the Winter Olympics. The first full day of competition ended without any medals for Team USA. Americans failing to take home any medals in speed skating, biathlon, ski jumping, and cross-country skiing. There have been some disappointments in curling. Brother and sister team Matt and Becca Hamilton losing again, this time to China. It's looking highly unlikely they'll make it to the next round. Alex Stone, ABC News, Pyeongchang. Listen up, beer fanatics. Arizona Beer Week has officially started, and today is the main event. Rob Fulmer with the Arizona Crafts Brewers says today is the 18th annual Arizona Strong Beer Festival. We have approximately 70 breweries out of the 100 that are in Arizona attend this festival, and many of them offering two or three different types of beers. The event starts at 1 p.m. at Steel Indian School Park in Phoenix. Tickets to enter are $60. Let's get a check on traffic. Here's John Michaels from the KTAR Traffic Center. And a couple of issues on the 60 Superstition Freeway. Still a factor on the 60 westbound at Mill. Earlier crash. Still off right on the shoulder, but now in the clearing stage. And just up the road at Priest, a couple of vehicles up on the shoulder as well. This report brought to you by AJ's Fine Foods. Visit AJ's for your Valentine's Day dinner. Take home an elegant lobster tail. And to pair with champagne and a divine dessert. Or choose a chef-prepared dinner for two from their bistro. AJ's Fine Foods, purveyors of love. That's your traffic, KTA. KTAR News. KTAR weather for the valley today. Mostly sunny skies with a high of 82 degrees. Tomorrow, sunny skies again with a high of 79 degrees. Right now, it's 72, 72 degrees in Phoenix. Weather brought to you by Howard Air. I'm Griselda Satino on Arizona's news station, KTAR News. Trust. It's hard to earn and sometimes even harder to find. If you live or work in downtown Phoenix, Matt Allen's Virginia Auto Service is celebrating over 20 years of award-winning service at the corner of 7th Street and Virginia. Recognized as one of the best service shops in the country, their customers have come to trust Virginia Auto Service for its A-plus rating by the BBB, two-year 24,000-mile warranties, and free transportation to and from your home or office. 20-plus years of earning your trust. Virginia Auto Service. They're serious about service. Three world-class resorts and six award-winning golf courses. That's what awaits you at the JW Marriott Luxury Golf Group. In Scottsdale, the legendary JW Marriott Camelback Inn and Golf Club with 36 holes of renowned golf at the Herds and Fry Ambiente and Arthur Hills Padre Courses. In Tucson, the scenic JW Marriott Star Pass Resort and Spa with 27 holes of Arnold Palmer Signature Golf. And in Phoenix, the Faldo and Palmer Courses at the spectacular Wildfire Golf Club at the JW Marriott Desert Ridge Resort. Come experience the JW Marriott Luxury Golf Group. Having an accident is stressful. Dealing with the repair process shouldn't be. Hi, Leo Petrozella for Campus Body Salon. We've taken the stress out of collision repair since 1973, and here's a couple of tips to de stress your repair. Make your own choice. Some insurance companies try to convince you that you must use their approved shop for your repair. Not true. Arizona state law allows you to choose the facility that's right for you. Beware of the cheapest estimate. Typically, it's the one from the insurance company cutting corners to trim costs or focusing on appearance only. At Campus Body Salon, appearance is important, but structural integrity and safety are even more critical. Campus Body Salon, independent, family-owned and operated, and bumper-to-bumper radio approved. Check out our Cash for Your Crash program where we pay you 10% off of your repair up to $1,000. Campus Body Salon, the best care in collision repair. Few cities are as car-centric as Phoenix, and this is the show that will help you to better understand that machine you depend on to get around the valley. It's Bumper to Bumper Radio. KTAR News on 92.3 FM and the KTAR app for Android and iPhone. Welcome back to Bumper to Bumper Radio. I am Dave Riccio here along with Matt Allen, and we're here helping with your car. We've got Larry, Kenny, Anthony, and Naz, and a couple more coming through at 602-277-5827. What is Bumper to Bumper Radio? It is a show designed to help put you in the know about cars. What else is Bumper to Bumper Radio? 
Bumper to Bumper Radio is a network of auto repair shops that uh, that Matt and I completely believe in. We're more than happy to carte blanche, go there. They'll take care of you, you know, that type of thing. So if you're what I consider an orphan customer, and there's a few of those out there, Matt, more, more than there should be, you need to go get a relationship with a with an auto repair shop. And you're going to find good, if you don't have one, if you got one, stay there because that relationship is valuable to you. So, uh, but if you don't have one and you, you, how do I look, how do I find one? Well, a great place to start is bumper to bumper com. There's a list of shops there. And, uh, one of the shops that we're going to have on next week, it's no secret that I don't know much about diesels. <laughs> so I'm really happy to have, uh, Kurt Rock from Kurt's Auto Repair on next week. And he's got a couple couple technicians from his shop maybe joining us. So next week, if you got diesel questions and you're like, I'm not calling Dave because Dave don't know nothing about <laughs> diesels, well, i got backup next week. You've so. got backup. I won't be here. I won't have to answer any of those diesel questions. I'll be off in Las Vegas. So Kurt will be the best one in here. And he's up off of I-17 in Bell, basically. And uh, they do they work on everything from grocery getters to big diesel trucks, you know, not huge diesel trucks, but, you know, you got your Dodge 25, 3500 right got down. no big rigs up there. Yeah, no big rigs. <laughs> but they're the guys to go to. And, uh, and when I have people call me, people call me, they say, hey, I'm, I'm broken down up here. What should I do? Go to Kurtz. Go to Kurtz. Yep. If your so. car hurts, take it to Kurtz, right? <laughs> anyway, we got to get to the phone. So let's go with Larry in Chandler with 2015 uh, Hyundai Sonata. How can we help you, Larry? You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Hi, thanks for taking my call. By okay. the way, to uh, back you guys up on what you were talking about maintenance, I changed my oil between 2,500 and 3,000 miles, point blank. You take care of it, it'll take care of you. Going on further to our being really uh, maintenance conscious, um, is it time to change my spark plugs at uh, 95,000 miles with the coil pack? Is it the original set of plugs in there yet? Yes. Yes. Yeah, I mean, I would look in the owner's manual. I was looking for some spark plug change the other day on something. It was 120,000 miles before the first recommendation, Dave. Here's but, here's here's my thing with spark plugs, Larry, is that uh, they, they make the spark plug better. Spark plug, you used to be able to get one for uh, 89 cents. You know, now they're like 20 bucks, some of these spark plugs. And they're better, and they last longer, and they do a better job. The problem is when you leave them in there too long, sometimes they don't want to come out. So it's yeah. it, rather than have problems with the heads or the threads in the head, you know, anything like that, I, I, I think 90,000 miles, I, I don't think you'd be overdoing it change spark plugs. No, I, no, I don't either. And heck, some cars still are showing them at, at 40,000 miles, some of the Volkswagens. I mean, they're, they're such, you know, it used to be 30, 60, 30,000 miles, 60,000 miles. Even before that, it was 15, 12 miles. or 15,000 <laughs> miles on the spark plugs. But you're right. That's back when they were 39 cents or, or 77 cents or something like that. Uh, so... And the other thing is, I think a lot of these coils, you know, they're over the top of the plug anymore. They burn out because the because the resistance on the plugs gets up as yeah. they wear out. So, you know, I see coils failing because plugs got so worn out, and didn't get changed. So, mm-hmm. absolutely, yep. don't don't forget about the spark plugs. Thanks for the call, Larry. Six zero two two seven seven five eight two seven. Let's go with Kenny. Uh, he's got a two thousand seven GMC Canyon. How can we help you, Kenny? You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Hi, good afternoon. I'm glad you guys took my call. I appreciate it. You bet. Hey, man, I have a 2007 Caddy with the L5 in it. Um, it popped up a code, a, a P2444. Um, it referred back to the secondary air injection pump stuck open. Um, I let it go for a week because I was going to uh, check it out a little bit farther on the following week, but then when I went back and I pulled the codes out again, the code was gone. Could you kind of explain that one to me? Did you? Were you? Does your scanner allow you to get into the history history codes? Because in the in these vehicles, sometimes codes will set, and uh, and if it if it doesn't see that failure again after so long, it'll it'll actually pull it back out of the computer. But it may still be in the history code. Yeah, in that well, I was able to get into the history, but it didn't. It showed me no history codes. Okay. So what? But what that is. Yeah, I think you said stuck open, right? Yeah, stuck open. The code is actually stuck on, not open. I'm stuck on, that works, stuck yeah. Stuck on. And what that is, this has got an electric, your car used to have an air pump driven by the belt. Well, now the air pump is the secondary air injection, and it is electronic. So that has to be controlled. The computer has to tell it when to come on. It has to go through a fuse. So you have to, you know, all that has to be working, which it is because it's stuck on. I would be betting that you have a relay 
mm, that sticking. has that sticks occasionally. And and the reason it knows it doesn't know the relay stuck, it just knows because the oxygen sensor is going, hey man. Where's all this air coming from? The oxygen sensor knows when that secondary air injection pump is. Because what it's doing is taking fresh filtered air and it's putting it directly into the exhaust system. And the, ca- and the oxygen sensor knows when that's happening. So I would be looking at the relay. This is when you need to get the, you know, this is not an air injection pump problem. This is a control of the air injection pump problem. So I would be starting with a wiring diagram. But at this point, maybe you just don't need to worry about it. It's probably going to come back, so you might do some research and get prepared for it. But I would put my money. I'm going to Vegas next week. I'm throwing 20 on the relay, Dave. Oh, man. We had a car in our shop this week with an intermittent issue, very intermittent issue. It had some codes in it not related to what the actual problem was. And that's the <laughs> and so I kept calling the guy. I said, it's not acting up. We've cleared out the codes. None of me is returning. You know, none of this is really making sense. We're going to have to have this happen. So I sent our, one of our technicians on a, on a long road test, and uh, I got a call from the side of the road. What's going on? The car's on oh, fire. The car's on fire. <laughs> <laughs> <It's amazing. laughs> but what happened is his alternator was going bad. And because the alternator was going bad, it was causing other uh, diagnostic trouble codes that we had, but it wasn't acting up when we had it in our bay and we were testing the bay. Everything was testing out normal, but the alternator... <laughs> But up that, in smoke. That goes back to the sensitivity of the battery, how we're telling you you've got to have a good battery in there. Yep. And why we recommend the interstate batteries. But they, you alternator too. If it's getting, maybe you're getting voltage spikes and surges, not necessarily that the battery is low, but that it's too high. You're getting some feedback or some AC voltage. That's the other thing you get by, by skipping out on a battery is you're going to get, you're going to get unneeded trips to the auto repair shop or the auto parts store for check engine lights that may just be a result. I mean, if this if this if this guy would have pulled into the auto parts store, they would have said, "Oh, you need a you know you need an engine this sensor and that sensor." Yeah, try and, a couple oxygen sensors and yeah, some stop leak while you're at it. Yeah, exactly. They would have sold him a bunch of stuff that wouldn't wouldn't have taken care of his alternator that was about to catch on fire. <laughs> <laughs> right. Oh my. God. So anyway, well, those was, are the kind of stuff that we go through, and it wasn't a serious fire. It was like not not a big deal, but uh, it's a younger kid that we have working at a shop that goes to UTI, so we use him for some road testing. Boy, he, it was a good thing he put Scotch Guard in his shorts that day. Well, it was funny, Dave, when you called me. You called me a little freaking out like you know, ah man car catches on fire while we're test driving i'm like wait a minute dave was it before you worked on it or after you worked on it? that was the important question dave was like this is the first test drive it's like Whew. well at least you can for sure say it wasn't your fault it wasn't our fault yeah <laughs> sure. so but that's always a phone a fun phone call well that intermittent problem you were having not so intermittent anymore <laughs> Yeah, you know, we're really not going to have to fix that because the car burned to the ground. <laughs> Which it didn't. So. It didn't. It, it, was, was, it wasn't too so big of a deal. So what you do? Do a little wiring harness repair and put all the Well, you know, a section of wiring harness burn up. They don't they don't sell them new, you know what I mean? So we're tracking it down, going to the junkyard, that kind of thing. So fixing cars is not always easy. Thanks for the call, Kenny. 602-277-5827. Let's go with Anthony in Phoenix. He's got a 1998 Chevy S10 pickup. How can we help you, Anthony? You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Hello guys, how you doing? Fantastic. Um, so I guess I got a problem with my steering. Um, I, I took my truck in to get it aligned, and once I got it aligned, the steering wasn't straight anymore. It was kind of going crooked. <laughs> and then I took it back, back to the guys. They said I needed another, like an arm bar. So I, they they added that to it then it was like loose so when i would go down the street i could move my steering wheel and i would be going it would just like sloppy i guess uh-huh. in, the, in the steering um so i took it back uh they said i needed um a gearbox so they tried to do the alignment again and, and it just it was just just really really sloppy then they put in a gearbox um for the steering now it's kind of it's it's not as sloppy when I'm going straight down the road, but if I make a turn, uh, it's like sloppy again. It makes sense. Dave, now, Dave when you wanted to ask you a question, but I want to know why'd you get the alignment? I did. Yeah. I did that on purpose. I'm talking over you, Dave. Right. So, uh, well, so you went you went in for an alignment, and they aligned it first before yeah. they told you that you had worn components. No, no, no. So I went in to get the alignment done, and because my my tire was wearing wrong. 
Okay. Um, on on my passenger side, so it was it was wearing unevenly. So I I went to get the alignment done. He, he got it done. He said, "Well, you might have a little issue with it." He said it was tricky for S tens to get them aligned, is what he was telling me. Hmm. That's. That... Um. Did and you when how did much line, when you had slop in there? So you say you're driving down the road. If you took if you had your hand up at twelve o'clock on the steering wheel and you kind of found the neutral place and you could wiggle it left and right a little bit, was there an inch uh, in there or is there three inches in there? Uh, probably about an inch or less. Okay, it's not too it's not bad. A ton of wear. You know? uh, yeah. Well, I had the here's the here's the thing is I, I had the steer, the whole front end redone probably. Two years ago, okay. Uh, it's pretty much all new components down there, except for well, now I got a new gearbox, <laughs> right? And I got a, another arm bar. I can't remember what. what Idler arm, probably. Idler arm. So Anthony, I guess we haven't really got to what's the question? Maybe we didn't let. Well, you... it's still it's still sloppy. Like when I like if I if I'm driving down the freeway, if I'm driving down like a normal like 40, 40 miles an hour, it's not bad. If I go down the freeway and I'm making like a, a you know those long turns, it will it will like kind of when I make try to go back straight, it it almost mm. and it's kind of scary. Mm. Um, and and I can move it probably about a little more than an inch going back and forth when I'm going down the freeway, but it won't not not necessarily when I'm driving down a slow road like right. forty miles and under, if that makes sense. Well, I think. Dave, I, what Anthony needs to do is probably get back to the shop and get with somebody and go on a test drive. I, I'm a little bothered by the process. You know, you go mm -hmm. in for an alignment because you got a tire wear, and they do an alignment and just send you out. Oh, I got a worn component. Oh, component didn't worn out in the five miles or two days or a week that we just drove right. it. And then they do that, and you go back for a steering gear. Yeah, it's a and lot. It's like. Isn't there a coupler between that steering shaft and the gearbox there? I always see those things worn out, yeah. <clears throat> and they're kind of overlooked. Little, It's a little rubber. Uh, uh, yeah, but on, the, on the steering shaft yeah. itself. So, yeah, I think you, you need to go get a good look at what, you know, just get with somebody. I think it just needs to be escalated to a manager or somebody, uh, and not in a confrontational way. Yeah. Just need to go in there, hey, guys, you know, we've had this. Here's, here's my visit. Here's the paperwork. Something's still not right. Can can we schedule some time to go for a test drive? And, you know, by the way, I've made arrangements, and or if you can help me get a rental car, you can have my car for two or three days and just let them, you know, th that's probably how I would yeah. suggest. Yeah, let them, know what's, let them know what's most important to you, what you want to get fixed. So when we come back, we've got Naz, we've got Ray, and we got Aaron. You listen to Matt and Dave, your KTR Car Guys, Bumper to Bumper Radio. Matt and I share car repair tips weekly to help you keep your car safely on the road, and a few of them are easy to do. Yep, you're right, Dave, and one of the easiest is to have a dependable battery that you can trust to get you started no matter what the conditions. Interstate batteries are what we trust at Bumper to Bumper Radio. In fact, they're what we use at our own shops for our customers. If you're like most people, your car is one of your most valuable investments. Make sure you take care of that investment with the power necessary to get you where you need to be. Interstate batteries are America's number one replacement brand with the factory fresh guarantee, and they're easy to find at good shops everywhere. Cars or trucks, Interstate has you covered with long life and performance in our harsh desert climates with products like Megatron Plus. It carries a 30-month free replacement and a six-year performance guarantee. Interstate batteries, no battery lasts longer. Check them out at interstatebatteries.com. Ouch! Being out of tune is no fun and maybe even a little painful. Hi, this is Lee Weatherby owner of Accurate Automotive in Mesa. At Accurate, we are a family-owned and operated one-stop automotive repair shop that specializes in building long-term relationships that are in tune with your needs, not ours. We've been recognized nationally as one of the top shops in the country, but for over 20 years, our priority has stayed focused on providing quality automotive service and repair at a fair price. I invite you to come in and see the difference an in-tune relationship can make for you and your car. With our free courtesy inspection, a $49 value, we feel it is well worth our investment in you because we believe good long-term relationships start early with your first walk through our doors. Accurate Automotive, home of friends serving friends, just off Broadway and Robson in Mesa since 1992. For more information, check us out online at accurateautomotiveaz.com today. Oh, 
Well, welcome back to Bumper to Bumper Radio. This is Matt Allen along with Scarface Dave Riccio <laughs> on the side of me. And we are talking about cars like we do every single Saturday at 11. Dave and I evolve into your KTAR car guys who sometimes think we're funny and sometimes <laughs> we are we are not. But we as are long always, as we think we are, that's all that matters. But we are always here to help you with that pesky automobile of yours. We that can go with sometimes be problematic, and I guess if it weren't for those pesky little automobiles, Dave and I wouldn't be here every Saturday helping you with those. I don't things, know what I, I don't like, know what I would be doing. You know, I you know working on cars has like been a boomerang for me. You know, I was all, you know as a kid, you know I was changing the oil on my dad's car, you know, in, in junior high because I like working on cars, and I just wanted an excuse to work on a car. And so, uh, you know, I got an auto repair. I got out of it for like four years. And I was very, very uncomfortable for four years. And yeah. then I got back to it. I'm like, ah, I'm home, you know. Yeah. So it's just, it's in your blood. It's like a boomerang. You try and leave the business, and it brings you right it, back. It draws you right back in. It sucks you in like quicksand to your death. For sure. <laughs> <No>. Right. <clears throat> well, we got Naz. We got uh, Aaron Gilberto. And we're going to go with Ray in Apache Junction, 07 Nissan Pathfinder. How can we help you on that Pathfinder, Ray? You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Yeah, um... The other guy was talking about a catalyst system efficiency code. Mm -hmm. I have one of those, the 0420 code. What was the code? I was again? curious if it's the catalyst or if it's actually like an O2 sensor. Well, that's where the diagnostic process comes in, my friend. We don't know. I mean, the, the computer says... I'm seeing that this catalytic converter is not as efficient as I would like it to be. But guess who's telling him that? The oxygen sensor. So is the oxygen sensor telling the truth? That's what we've got to figure out. Is he telling the truth about the catalytic converter, or is he making up a story? So, so if, you're, if we're looking at this in my bay, mm -hmm. right, so we go look at the, the pre-cat sensor, mm -hmm. and we're going to look at this, this chart of rich to lean, you know, nice spikes, sharp. Yeah, we're looking at an oscilloscope, the waveform of the, the signal being sent back to the computer from the oxygen sensor in front of the catalytic converter. And on the other side of the converter, we're going to look at the signal from that sensor, and it'll be kind of these rounded off, more curvy, more subtle uh, type of lines, and we're going to be comparing those two. So that's some of the data that we're looking at when we're trying to diagnose these things to say, is this thing working? Do we have a – sometimes, I mean – when you do get these little print-offs from, from uh, Acme Auto Parts, they say, well, it could be the catalytic converter, it could be an oxygen sensor, it could be the wiring, and it could be the computer. That's a lot of stuff. Yeah, or anything <laughs> in between. Anything in between that's got to be verified. So so there, there's that's where the diagnostic piece comes in. You know, it very well could need a catalytic converter, you know, but I've seen them go the other way where there's something else going on. You know, engine's mm -hmm. not running the way it should, screwing screw with the numbers. Yeah, and then, you, you know, another just quick note on catalytic converters. When you, depending on the mileage when you replace that catalytic converter, you probably may want to just go ahead and replace the oxygen sensors also. Maybe not both, depending on the cost, at least the pre-cat one. The pre-cat one's the one that's going to tell you, really affect the way the engine runs. The one after the catalytic converter is just there to, as a verifier that the things are working. But the other problem is the catalytic converters usually fail because something made them fail. A poorly running engine, mistuned, carbon buildup, or something like that. So before you replace the catalytic converter, make sure the engine and everything else is running and operating properly as well. The other thing, Ray, too, when you go to buy a cat, it's going to be really attractive to try and buy an aftermarket, less expensive catalytic converter. If you can still buy an original equipment catalytic converter from Nissan, that's the one you buy. <clears throat> it may be three times the price as the aftermarket one, and that's where the you got to kind of weigh that out because there's a lot of savings to go with, you know, kind of a weld in place kind of thing. But you know what? They don't last that long. They they get you they get the check engine light out for a year, then they're out of warranty, and you're you're buying another cat again. So I'm a big proponent of factory cats when you can do it with the modern car. They're way too sensitive not to be doing it that yeah, way. Yeah, and it doesn't mean go to the Nissan dealer and get your car fixed. If you have your shop, go to your shop. We if can get have, a, if you yeah. have your bumper to bumper radio shop. Go there. We're going to be the same price. I did a water pump on a, on a uh, Pathfinder uh, last week in my shop. It had 350,000 miles on it. The car still looked good. And 
<clears throat> and the guy was like, you know what? I'm going to keep running this car. You know, this Why car not? is great. It keeps going. So you're going to have that car longer than you think, so put a good cat on it. Let's go with Aaron in Phoenix. He's got a 2001 Jeep. What kind of Jeep do you have, Aaron? It's a Jeep Grand Cherokee. Okay. What's going on I with have it? A- well, it's, it's hard starting right now, and it just recently. I had my fuel filter changed about a year ago with an aftermarket fuel filter, and I get some hard starts. I changed the IAC, cleaned that out. That really didn't help. But sometimes it starts great, and sometimes it starts it takes a crank in a while, and the battery's checked good twice that I've checked it. Do you think it's a fuel pump, or do you think that fuel filter is just not very good? Well, you when you say so, it's an extended crank time. Crank, 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 and then it fires up. Yeah, right? does it do and it, it? Fires up, and some sometimes it takes like once a month. It takes a long time, and I got to push the gas a little bit. Mm-hmm. But other than that, it it always starts. It just takes a long time. I think pushing the gas is just coincidental because there's really nothing happening with fuel right. delivery when you do that. Um, does it do it hot, cold? Does it matter? Is it first start up in the morning? Does it if you go out and it, yeah, first sometimes in the morning it starts. You know, without really cranking at all, and then, it, you know, it just it's just so temperamental that that's the problem. I just don't want to be so. It's got two hundred twenty-five thousand miles, so it's got a lot of miles, but it's always been good, and it seems like it's not running quite as well. It just the idle seems a little bit low, and I I thought cleaning that IAC would help that a little bit, but it didn't. Right. Well, Dave, I don't know what what you're thinking, but. I, I, so the real question was, do you think it's a fuel pump? I, we don't have enough information to, to make right. it to make <clears throat> that call, but we can do a fuel pressure test. Well, one of the things um, too he can do also just a driveway test. Turn the key on. You're going to hear the fuel pump prime. You can hear it come on. Okay, you can cycle that a couple times, and then if it and then if it fires right up, that is a good indication that we may have a fuel pump problem. It's certainly not a test. We're going to put a pressure gauge on it. And see if it matches up to spec, and if there's a problem there, you know for sure. You know, and I maybe be looking at thinking about a coil ignition coil, probably problem or something like that, like that, not not sparking hot enough. But again, that's where we got to test. Or and sometimes it's process elimination. There's not an exact science to 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 fixing cars, but uh, you know maybe for Valentine's Day you want to take your sweetheart's car, go get it detailed, or bring it to the shop and get an oil change, or or take care of it. I always say trade cars with your spouse, so maybe you can. You can do that, and ladies, you can take your guy's car in, and guys, you my can wife's car is way, is way nicer, so uh, she won't let me take her car on uh, Valentine's Day. <laughs> I wouldn't either, <laughs> <laughs> for sure. So anyway, we've got a couple on the line that we're going to get to right after the show. So we've got Naz and Aaron. Join us next week. We got uh, Kurt from Kurt's Auto Repair on with us, talking a lot about diesel. See you next week.